Welcome to the podcast of data and analytic in business. We will learn from the leading industry experts using data and analytics to solve the problems and create values in practice. We will also learn where the industry is heading to and how data and analytics will shape the industry in the future. Most importantly, how they are preparing their business for digital transformation and disruption in the future. I'm your host, Jason Tan, and thank you for listening. In this episode, we have Albert Ishak. Albert is the CFO of Airbus Indonesia. Airbus is a global leader in developing aerospace products such as commercial aircraft and helicopter. In Indonesia, the company is also involved in providing services to the Indonesia Service and Space Agency. I started the interview by asking Albert about his academic background and what advice he would give to young data scientists who are interested in progressing their career to be a CFO. At some point of the conversation, we also went into his experience in starting new Rhizon and how that experience cemented his professional career at Airbus. Naturally, I'm curious to know about the use of data and analytics at Airbus Indonesia and I will share a few examples how data science and emerging technology are used at Airbus around the world. This includes Airbus Skyway and digital twin technology, route optimization for commercial aircraft, predictive maintenance to prolong the asset lifetime value. I then asked Albert about the use of data analytics in his area, finance department. He shared with me about their works in building the financial model to better understand the company cash flow, budgeting, and costing through the data analytics combined with finance automation. Not only that allowed him and his team to better predict the financial health of Airbus Indonesia, it also allows them to better manage finance when assessing the money market. Like any other organization, none of this is easy. So I asked Albert about the past challenges. Albert shared with me his view on harmonizing the legacy system, as well as the long-term vision that Airbus and Global CFO have for the future. If you are a CFO operating at a well-established company that come with legacy system, I would highly recommend you listen to this episode to find out how Albert is improving the financial health at Airbus Indonesia through finance automation and harmonizing the legacy system. If you have any question for Albert or myself, make sure you send us an email or message on LinkedIn. Finally, this episode is sponsored by the new program at DDA. It is an analytic leader mentorship program for senior manager and executive in the business team who want to develop data-driven business to drive customer experience excellent and have an impact on the revenue. For a small one of annual fee, you get the book Unlimited Strategy Session for a full year. For more information about this program, please reach out to me. Last but not least, make sure you click the subscribe button before the interview starts so you will be the first to be informed on the latest episode on how business leaders run a high-performance organization using data science. I am your host, Jason Tan, and thank you for listening. Hello, hello, Albert. Welcome to the Analytic Show podcast. Thank you for dialing in from all the way to Jakarta, Indonesia. I'm so excited to talk to you today about the data analytic at Airbus. How are you doing? I'm fantastic and it's great to be here as well. <laughs> now, let's get things started. I look at your profile on LinkedIn and learn a bit more about your career. I, I thought that is fascinating and I want to share that with the listener and see how they can learn from you in terms of the career growth over the years. So I find that you have a mix of uh, bachelor degree and MBA. So how has this mix of science and business degree have helped you in your career so far? I think I need to say thanks to my mom. (laughs) Let me start with the story first, right? So basically, I'm pretty good at math. That's cool. So When I'm about to enter university back then, I was thinking to do pure maths, which is basically what I did anyway. So my, but my mom being an Asian mom, she said that you also done well in economics. Why don't you have another, she didn't say safety net. I I tried to find the right word, but she basically said that it's good to diverse or hatch your career. And then I was like, yeah, okay. So I 
I took double degree, so I did commerce and science. So commerce is finance and economics, and science in pure mathematics and statistics. So cut the short short, back in university, I enjoyed math so much. First year, second year, I did so well in maths and also for my commerce as well. And basically, I did an honors combined those two. But in the honor year, I realized that I'm not a typical, I would say typical, I'm not a researcher, meaning that I was planning to become, I was planning to do PhD and also try to become lecturer as well, or basically become professor. And then when I did my thesis, I realized, nope. This is not for me. So luckily, I listened to my mom. Um, so cut the short short, I basically tried to do a little bit of finance. So I did an internship for a hedge fund based in New York. And ba- that basically helped to combine those two. So coming back to your question again, I think having a Bachelor of Science and also MBA is really helped me for my career. But it's also because I guess having MBA is just a general knowledge. I think everyone, if you work in the business, it's always nice to know what is business is organized and what is profit and loss, cash flow and other stuff. So yeah, so I think that's really helped me to my career to know the general view from MBA and also specific knowledge. In my case, it's more mathematics and also data science. On that note, would you advise the young professional who are in the data science to go for business degree to advance in their career? And what is the expectation that they should have? I think it also depends. <laughs> it's a fair typical MBA answer, by the way. It depends. But if you work for data science and also for commercial purposes, I would recommend yes. Meaning that no matter what you do, when you create a model, when you're forecasting whatsoever, they're always going to be it's going to flow to the financial anyway. So when you build a model and we, you always try to put in the mind what you're trying to predict and how this actually means for the business. At least that's basically my mindset when I build a system or basically a model in any project. But however, if you're thinking more in the using data science, more in the, I would say, research purposes or even in the academic purposes, you don't really need business, to be honest, because you're going to need to greedy about the algorithm itself. Try to optimize what is the best way to basically to optimize the algorithm, for example. You don't really need to be a business degree. But again, it depends on what you would like to do. I like that deep independence answer. I think it sounds like really typical. <laughs> like you said it every year. Now, let's get into the actual professional life. Please share with us a bit about Airbus Indonesia and how is it different to what is the focus of the Airbus Indonesia? So Airbus Indonesia is basically Airbus just Indonesia. <laughs> Airbus is a, we are an aircraft manufacturer and also a defense and space company. So Airbus has three divisions. We have commercial, which is basically the most famous one. So we have A320, A220, 380, basically for commercial purposes to dis, to to transport people or cargoes from point A to point B, as simple as that. And this is probably the bigger part of the business as well. We also have what we call defense and space. And in its name, defense is basically more how a country or a government or a region defends themselves. So in here, we have military aircraft, we have secure communication, we have border solution, you know, all these all powerful things. Probably that's the way I describe it. Drones as well. And space, just in this name, space, anything to do with the um, space out there. We have satellites. We also have a rocket launcher and other stuff to basically to put everything in space. So it's a quite diverse company. And also the other division, it's helicopters. In helicopters, there's a, basically what I said before, combination of those two. There is a civil, which is more like commercial, or also the, the government or military purposes of the helicopter as well. So that's basically Airbus in general. Airbus Indonesia, it's the legal entity in Indonesia. We are actually all of what I mentioned before, because even though if we're talking from the revenue perspective, Indonesia is not, we don't have a significant, significant footprint in terms of revenue, but in terms of complexity, we have this whole three divisions presence in Indonesia. So if people ask what is Airbus in Indonesia, I would say it's basically Airbus, but in Indonesia. 
that's basically what I want to say. Right. So how extensive is Airbus Indonesia serving or helping to manufacture the product and services from the global perspective for Airbus then? So we are first and foremost is selling the aircraft itself. If we're talking about the commercial aircraft, but also the ma- uh, the maintenance as well. So just like car, there's there's a garage. In our case, is we call it MRO, which maintenance, repair, repair, and overall. So we're basically you maintain the aircraft itself. So we provide this MRO services, or we also provide the technical assistance for the MRO providers, or even to the air, air aircraft, not aircraft, the airline itself. If they would like the help on how to how to maintain the aircraft, but on top of that, we also have other services, which is basically associated with that. Basically, how to run your airline more efficient and other stuff. On the defense and space, we also work and have a close collaboration with various government in the world. Try to look at the strategy how to defend their national interests and to defend their people, and also what kind of product portfolio that. That do they need in order to do that, and also the the capability that they need, development that they need as well, and also when we look at the the top the space, we are also looking at the communication, how the data flow from one place to another, and how can we facilitate that, and also how we can make sure it's also secure. Tell us about your role as the CFO at Airbus Indonesia. My role is quite diverse, but at the end of the day, it's basically the support from the financial perspective about this whole business. I'm looking at the profitability of each of the contract. If we're talking about the business itself, looking for each business cases, what kind of opportunity we should pursue or not. That's probably the commercial aspect of that. I also have, I would say, like an admin role or basically the support role within the company. Manage the cash flow, making sure that we are always liquid and able to pay our liabilities, be able to pay our meet our payroll as well. We also have the admin responsibility for HR is under me as well, and also the procurement is under me as well. And we go. That's basically my my scope or my perimeter in here. But if I want to describe myself in general, I'm basically here to help the the company. So meaning that. The business can think about their own, meaning they they run the operation. But any other aspect, including IT, is it's going to be under me. Then I'm going to help them as well in order to achieve it. On top of that, I'm also making sure that whatever opportunity or strategy that they pursue is always profitable and also at the best interest of the company. The role itself it covers quite a few function. How? Important or how do you introduce the data analytic to each of those function and making sure that they are really using the data and analytic in optimizing the works that they do for Airbus Indonesia. So Airbus Indonesia, even though we have a quite extensive portfolio, we are still a subsidiary of the whole mothership. So meaning, I don't have a full control about the IT infrastructure that we can we can use. Unfortunately, including all these nice fancy things compared to what I used to have before, I basically don't have this luxury of pursuing an let's say more strategical IT or technological support because there's a huge layer on top of me in order to determine that. So what I can do is only controlling or basically predicting what kind I can control or basically what we have. So, for example, because The blood of a company is a cash flow. When I started this role, what I realized it's basically what we also lack of, meaning that we don't have the great visibility about what we can do. So in here, I took the initiative to create a model in order to predict our cash flow. Relatively simple model. It's not even linked to our ERP, meaning because I try to circumvent the system in this way, meaning that it's just independent model with different variables in order for us to know exactly. The cash profile for the next few months, and what kind of solution we need to do, or what kind of remedy we need to take, or what kind of investment we can pursue with this amount of cash that we have, and that's basically, I would say, the only thing that within my perimeter that I can, I'd say, have the independent and freedom to actually do something about it is only our cash flow model. That's basically what I can say. Right now, 
Space and aviation is new to me. I must say I have zero SME knowledge about this area. Well, you're limited of what you can do in the Airbus Indonesia because of the influences and the control from from the global operation. I'm curious to know, though, that what part of the overall of the operation at Airbus that is most influenced by data and analytics? I think this is not surprisingly, it's in our commercial arm, which is basically in our bigger business anywhere Any We have a product or basically a platform called Skywise. So Skywise at the end of the day, or basically in principle, is the digital twin of any aircraft in the world. We actually build a lot of things within this platform. Imagine that it's like a huge data lake, then, then there's, a, there's a lot of model that actually built um, inside of it, depending on what kind of data that the airline willing to share with us. But in principle, what we can do nowadays is predictive maintenance. Usually we do in the past without this data anyway, uh, maintenance is done when it's required or basically based on flight hours and other stuff. But nowadays with the IoT and also the data we collected within the live aircraft, we know exactly the state of each different parts. And with that, we have a live model to predict what kind of maintenance we need to do specifically for each of the aircraft. This, and depending on how how willing the airline share the data, we can also link that with our ERP system, meaning that if we know exactly that this aircraft A320 need a replacement of the main gearbox, let's say in six months, then we already alert our supply chain that we need this in Singapore in six months, meaning that we need to have an work order and other stuff within our supply chain to make sure that it's already ready in six months. So it's actually have a huge repercussion effect, just like in any other ERP. So it's become a new data point in our operation in order to build inventory for one and also work order and also the, the alert our supplier that we need this. So it's basically this predictive maintenance, I would say one of the, the better way to do it. And also, if we're talking about aircraft, it's basically anything to do with aircraft itself. Uh, predictive maintenance for this because one, if we're talking about the business, we also have the route of optimization because the with the help of the weather information, we know exactly in different temperature, in different altitude as well. So because of different temperature, different pressure in the in the in the air it's going to affect your fuel consumption so we we're going to optimize if you're going to travel from let's say from sydney to melbourne or sydney to perth if you're playing game it's quite simple right or in the map or in the road basically this is the road you have to take but in the if you're taking an aircraft it's actually a 3d world you can different altitude you can also take a bit to the right a bit to the left depending on which one is actually more efficient from fuel fuel burn consumption so this is what we also offer as well. And also this is actually a nice part or byproduct because we're optimizing the, the fuel burn. We actually be emitting also less CO2 to the world as well. So there's a lot of benefit in this model. What else? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of model actually within the aircraft itself. Even though probably it's not the most advanced, I would say modeling in the world. But then imagine this is a highly sophisticated product but then by applying some simple rules, it's actually there's huge benefit that that can be attributable to the outcome of the model itself. That was quite a lot of them that you have to share. I think it's so worthwhile. They could even go into each podcast episode for each of them. <laughs> I would be really interested to speak to the engineer to, to get them to share more in detail for each of those. One thing that I want to pick up, though, is that you talk about the Skyway and using the predictive model and also the data collected from all of the various things, including the IoT, whereby it could fed back into the digital twin and then do the simulation. So I would imagine that you could do the simulation on the digital twin now. I think some of the listener may not necessarily understand or familiar about the digital twin. In your own word, do you want to explain what is digital twin and how that is used to do the simulation based on the data and also the predictive uh, maintenance model? 
So digital twin, it's basically your twin in the, in the digital world. <laughs> That's the basically the way I describe it. I think it's easier to explain in human. Let's say you have a digital twin somehow in the digital world, right? If you decided that you would like to take a haircut, usually nowadays you can imagine if I take if I do a mohawk, how it's gonna look like. But in digital twin, and nowadays it's basically soft with, with AR anyway, that you can see how you're gonna sell yourself looks like with a mohawk anyway. So this is basically the same principle. If you imagine an aircraft and then you're thinking, what if you change this part? Or basically there's one part that basically there's a high probability is going to fail in the next, let's say, 90 days, even though it doesn't affect the safety of the aircraft but it might affect the efficiency of the engine. So basically, you basically can do a simple model or basically in digital twin. If you replace now and replace in 90 days later or when it's actually due, how much efficiency you're going to lose. And by doing that, you can do a simple business case should you replace it now or 90 days later because you're just talking about the fuel burn that you're going to, you're going to burn in excess compared to have this part replaced now. Fascinating. I think digital twin is becoming more and more common in various places. I know there are people who are building the digital twins for the heavy asset or even like stadium. I think that will really help the simulation. I really like that. What about the emerging technology like the artificial intelligence and machine learning? How extensive, I imagine you guys would be at the forefront of this in applying them. How extensive are you guys applying this sort of technology with this sort of assisting work that you already have, like the Skyway, the predictive maintainers, the route optimization, et cetera? So I would say you're totally right. We are probably one of the better company out there by having a lot of engineers and also the probably the smartest brain in the world. Unfortunately, this whole exciting things is basically more done in the operation side, just like what I said with the Skywise and other stuff. Unfortunately, I don't really know what they're actually doing at the moment. What I actually can tell you is basically we're focusing more on building the e-aircraft, mainly because this I also involved with Near Horizon before, and I think this is something that people are not, well, general public, not really aware where, why we are interested with hydrogen from 25 years ago. Let's start with that. So... Little that people know that Near Horizon also has hydrogen-powered bus, but the idea is also using a patent that basically created by, by Airbus. The idea is we had this vision of hydrogen aircraft a long time ago, but before some, this technology can be used for flying, it needs to be able to be done on the ground. So uh, the next step is need to be able to done with the bus, then car, that need to be done from a motorcycle and basically blah, blah, blah. So we are now building, that's basically the kind of dependency about this whole things. And we are actually moving the other way around, meaning that we, that's why we are investing 25 years ago on the a safe hydrogen, safe hydrogen tank, basically. And then we build up the motorcycle, um, build, we build the car and the car become the bus and now become the aircraft. So the, the main analytics is basically done in this, I would say, technology. And unfortunately, I don't really know um, exactly what they do at the moment, but I know that this um, huge department is doing mainly res- dedicated resources to that. What I can say, though, I wouldn't say we are, have, we are using the cutting edge of AI and machine learning in finance, but we are using a lot nowadays with the new group CFO that joined probably yeah, 2019, he actually, I really like his vision. I think in the future, the way he said that there's no accountant and or there wouldn't be any more accountant or controller in Airbus. There would be only data science and also the, let's say, controller or business partners, meaning they would be in general, the team would be split to two. One is data and the other one, it's basically the interface with the business. What we're building now, it's the, the reporting team on the data team. So most of the reports that we have nowadays is being automated. So what, what he said that, and this is true, there's a lot of times that the finance team does, it's a waste of time, meaning 
is it can be automated or can be it can be automated because we it can be simplified and it can be standardized and this is what we're building at the moment once we able to have the harmonized ERP then we can build this nice foundation of automated reports people can drill down easily and we can find quite just in a fingertip and this is where where we are at the moment and then the next step is basically to explain to this person that we come the interface with the business to explain and guide how it's going to be as well. I so agree with that, especially about the automation. And I want to come back to the automation in a second, but I want to focus and highlight a little bit about the company that you just mentioned, New Horizon. I want to give the listener a little bit of context about New Horizon and how that is important for you to do the role, or and especially where you are at the moment. You established a company called New Horizon. is the first prototyping as a service company. It sounds really exciting. I have read quite a little bit about that. Now, would you please share a little bit with our listener about this venture of yours and share a little bit about the prototyping as a service? I think that will give the listener a good context of why and how you are the right fit of where you are at the moment as well. Thank you for bringing it up. It's also a passion of mine. So probably I'll start with the background as well. Neo Horizon is a joint venture between Airbus and also LM Industry. I'm so lucky enough to be able to be selected to run the company from the inception, or basically from the idea. Let's take a step back in here. And back then, it's just an, we know the budget, but we don't exactly know what we would like to do with this company or this combination of company. So I work with my co-founder, in order to understand what can these two companies bring on the same t- to this venture and what we can do. So Neo Horizon, at the end, what we agree on when we do a lot of market research and talking with different people, it's basically a prototyping as a service. The idea is we can build and we can design and build a product as easy and as flexible as a software. Why do I say that? In the early 2000s, pre-2000 basically, when people build a software is a simple what the four chart. Basically, you basically have this idea what would you like to do. Then you put the specification, you send your developer to do it, the product built, put it in the market, and that's it. But then there's a huge changes when we introduce with the agile. So you basically build four small parts, and basically, depending on the customer feedback, you keep iterating the process as well. So this is the I would say the more efficient and better way to do product development. It has changes the software industry significantly. And there's a lot of SaaS nowadays, basically owing to this basic foundation. Unfortunately, what we saw, there's a gap in here. When we talk about the physical product, like car, any machinery or tools, there's not this type of things. It's as simple as you have an idea, you send it to design, design team. The design team is going to build a prototype. The prototype is going to be built. And then they're going to have the product itself and you do market research, blah, 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 and you do product launching. We think we can actually use the same methodology in the product development as well. And this is basically how Near Horizon position ourselves. So when you have an idea, we propose we can do a prototype for you and then you can test it right away. So we sh- shorten the product life cycle or product development cycle in order for you to have a better idea how it's going to develop before you're spending millions and a lot of times for your product development. That's basically New Horizon at heart. So in order for us to do so, we have the the world's biggest 3D printer, which is, yeah, and this is owing to our, no, I would say partner, but your holders, LM Industry, they can fully print the autonomous bus so we use the same printer in order for in, in our facility in order for us to actually be able to serve our customer to develop their product. So yeah, that's great in your horizon. It must be so exciting to be able to get, like you say, get some of the prototype because previously getting a prototype done is so difficult. I imagine it must have it must have been so helpful this experience of starting the New Horizon and also understanding about the manufacturing process. It must be so helpful for you to start your career at CFO. In your own word, how has that been helpful for your career at Airbus then? 
No, I think it's funny enough. I was chosen by the group CFO to run the, this venture because I was seen as entrepreneurial and also be able to have, a, in my own word, sane enough to know financially this, whether it's going to work or not work. So I'm basically the, I'm the crazy person from finance that willing to take this, this challenge. Basically, that's the way I describe it. But I really like this experience because the way I describe it to people around me, I have the benefit of becoming an entrepreneur while still being paid as a worker. I have this huge safety net, so I'm still get my salary, whatever. So if the company busts or doesn't work, I'm comfortable. Of course, though, I don't have the upside, which is what happened to me as well. But it's totally fine because for me, it was a huge learning experience because running from the inception, built the system around it as well. Another thing that I would say being a case study internal within finance is how we built the financial system within the horizon as well. Not only financial system, but talking about systems. But of course, we, because we are relatively small and we, are, we don't have this legacy system, so everything is called first. So we can build a, we a paperless company, one of, which is a huge achievement in Germany because they're still quite paper-based. So we follow from one of our partners that's saying that if you receive an invoice from one of your vendors and in physical form, just send it back and ask them to send it to this email. And this is what we've done. So everything is paperless. And it's actually not because only for environment, but also for a system. It's actually simplified the whole system anyway, meaning you always have the, you always have traceability and you know exactly. You only need to pay the invoice that arrive in your dedicated mailbox. So yeah, it's a, it's a great experience to set up the system and to think about the future proof about the system that you think it's going to grow with you once it's scale. Well, we, the crazy one, are the one who are going to change the world, as according to Steve Jobs. So <laughs> I told you about that. <laughs> Coming to the automation and this vision shared by the group CFO, share with us a little bit more about the automation, especially in the space of the finance automation that you are running and carrying out in Airbus Indonesia. Okay, I think there's a lot of RPA, but basically automation, but as simple as coming, going, going back to the basic, and this is not a long, it's not something reason, but we implement an RPA to, once we got an invoice, it's going to be automated to input it to the system as well. So it recognizes its tax recognition. It's probably one of them. And also nowadays, so unfortunately, I think that with RPA is interesting because we are aiming at the most manual part of the companies and then try to automate it. So in this case, probably still the biggest one in our area and it's basically more on the, more on the AR and also an AP as well. So we are automated the system. So I'll input it to the system directly. And then from there, you create an automated system, meaning the to build a schedule, which one we need to pay and which one is not, we don't need to pay. On top of that, that's being rejected because there is a misinformation it's also in car, it's also help us with the compliance. So meaning that there's sometimes there's an invoice without the PO, there's sometimes invoice that doesn't have the right name and it, it has a tax implication for us if if we pay, meaning that it can be right we have a trouble with our tax office. Um, but basically this is also help with our compliance. What else? And also after we built the schedule, that's going to flow into our cash flow system as well. So now we have a better visibility not only better, but also faster because with this RPA, everything is quite automated and we have daily update as well. So now we know exactly the profile of the working capital that we need each day. And then the treasurer be able to know if we have an excess cash or a shortage of cash and for them, so for him to actually to know what to do with the money market as well. So that's probably the biggest one that we are having in the whole company. We optimize into our cash management system. Yeah, that's basically what I can say most probably that we are doing at the moment. Just a quick note for the listener who are listening to this. So when I would say about RPA, it basically stands for Robotic Process Automation. So it's about automating all the manual tasks, the bit that you do repetitively every single day. I love you talk about how it can actually be used for the analyst or the accountant to understand what they should be doing in the money market as well. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? So it's basically as simple as the 
on top of that, there's another model actually. But let's start with the net cash or better visibility of the cash balance. So we now we know exactly how much cash we're gonna have tomorrow in five days or even next week or even up to three months. Basically, we have the model for three months. If we see a build up in our cash, maybe we can invest in more. Not in the money market anymore, but it can be short-term deposits, for example. So, or the other way around. If we see this, there is a shortage of cash coming up, and it's coming consistently about this X amount. We can ask one of our banks to meet the shortage, and we're going to pay a lower rate as well. So it's really it's basically a balancing act depending on what's going on in the company and also the profile what's going to happen in the next ninety days. We need to adjust our treasury as well. That's probably the biggest, like I said before, right? But there's there are many private projects that I led back in Europe. That's quite interesting as well. For example, we do costing. Costing is actually quite arcane in the, in Airbus at least because we have this huge database that we need to need to find how much does it cost historically, and then we need to build a quotation or costing sheet. How much this project gonna cost, and then how do we do pricing? So we automate this as well. Meaning, as a good cost estimate, you're basically looking more than one, depending on the parts, right? So sometimes the parts, you need to get contacts. It's great if you can find the equal parts, but most, the good estimator, it basically, you need to find a part that have the same capabilities that might be do a bit different. So basically, this model that we built are basically still a prototype at the moment. It has the the ability to recognize some parts that are quite similar. And then they're going to give suggestion to the estimator, how about using this part or this using this as a benchmark. So that's really help with the estimation because the what we realize from the cost, the costing process, the longest is actually looking at the reference. So by automating this process of benchmarking or looking at the database, that basically simplify the whole process as well, or basically make it faster and more accurate. I love it. That is such a good use of the data analytic and also the automation. It can be quite tricky in combining all those three area. What were the challenges that you guys face when implementing the automation RPA for finance automation or the costing automation? The main thing is for us because we are a huge company. I meaning huge and old company. Probably that's the. <laughs> I, the way I should describe it, because there's a lot of legacy system system in in the company, and it's very hard to harmonize it as well. It's the same theme, the same thing across in any models or basically any project that we are we are doing. We need to make it harmonized before we can play with the data, and this is the vision that the the CFO is doing at the moment. So we are going back to the basic, get the foundation right, but in the meantime, we're trying to do some project just like this one in order to get a data, a clean and meaningful data as well. It's always the hardest. And then after that, it's basically, it's quite a simple model development process. It's not too hard. It's always get the right data information is the hardest part. Do you want to share or explain a little bit, what do you mean by harmonize the legacy system? I, I thought it was quite interesting the way of putting that. Yeah, so because for Airbus, it's a, another byproduct is a result of four different companies merger so each of them has a different erp system even even a different sap model as well so for example i'm just talking i'm not going to go too much detail in here but we have mainly we have four what we call home countries is uk spain germany and france each of them have a different erp and even in those countries, in different programs, they have a different ERP, even though it's SAP, different model, right? It's not harmonized yet. So from one system to another, we need to create like a map or basically, yeah, it's, a, it's like a mapping that we need to do in order for them to be Apple and Apple. And this one, it's, it's very time consuming. And for an old system, for example, even some people don't really understand how it was built in the beginning, meaning it's been for long and people have been using this data and there's so, so many rows and columns and basically it's being collected from the system, but we don't really know what does it mean. And to be able to, I wouldn't say cut it, but basically if we don't, we, if we want to remove from the business, sorry, remove it from the data set, does it actually has an impact on something else? So it's really need to be very careful 
And then we need to understand really well what do we have at the moment and then how we can make it Apple and Apple before we can actually build something meaningful out of the data. I so agree. I think it is uh, really one of the problem and the obstacle for many of the traditional industry, whether it's uh, transport or finance, whereby they all have this legacy system. And especially throughout a period of years where all these merger and acquisition happen and they are just keep acquiring so many uh, legacy systems, I think it is probably the biggest challenges that they have to overcome in order to compete with the startup or the tech companies like Amazon, Facebook, Google, where they pretty much have their, they built the system from the ground up, right? And they have so much flexibility and intimate knowledge of understanding the system. I'm curious to know though, do you have any advice for the CFO who equally have to work around all of the legacy system in order to automate their finance operation? I think it's just, even though, to be very honest, I had a doubt about the direction that it was given of the group CFO in the very beginning. Because to be very honest, in order to simplify, not simplify, to harmonize the whole things, it going to take five years to do so. And then I said, five years just to harmonize this whole things when we can actually do something fun or basically something meaningful. But I totally agree with him now. It's, it's always important to get the, the basic right and the foundation right before we can actually make something meaningful out of it. And this is, should be a commitment that needs to be embedded in the business. Everyone needs to be aware that we are competitive in the market, but we can be much more competitive once this is done. So this is a high priority, but of course, this is not something need to be done by tomorrow because it doesn't mean that our company wouldn't succeed and would, wouldn't succeed if this doesn't happen tomorrow. So this is something that's high priority, but we we can spend time on it because we can afford it. But as long as it's going to bring a meaningful impact for us in the long term. So basically, I think I, I really like this approach. Take your time. Make sure that you you know exactly what you would like to do. And basic and the other and the most important thing is get the right person to actually run it for you. The CFO, our CFO hires someone from his old company, basically when he was a CFO in the previous company, this person also did the same thing for him back then. So yeah, he is a very good person as well to handle this. I agree. And speaking of that, getting the basic and the foundation right, one of your core focuses have always been about the team building. And you believe that it's all about the curiosity and having the right team. Share with us some of your team building philosophy. I believe in the human connection and I also believe in the you're only as strong as your team. And also another fact that I believe that your team is a leverage multiplier, meaning that no matter how efficient I am, I wouldn't be efficient as at least two of people in my team. So the more people you have in the team, the more leverage you have there as well. So your job as a as a team leader in this case or manager, you need to be able to get the most out of them and guide and coach them in order to reach their potential. I believe that when someone enters my team, it's also my duty and responsibility to make sure that he or she is fulfilled. So he or she has been helping me with my tasks and helping to achieve my goals, but it's also my duty and responsibility to make sure that they are always engaged, they do whatever they like, and they learn something they would like to, they learn something from the process and make sure that they achieve whatever they would like to to have in their life. I like how you're aligning the company goals and their personal career development. Now, you believe that companies should look at the employee holistically, not only at work, but also at home. Share with us what would be your advice for businesses to make this happen. I think the most fundamental things that I believe people need to be on the same page in here that output is not equal to the face time. When you don't see the person works, doesn't mean that the work is not going to be done. So the first thing, you need to have this trust. But just like what my parents keep saying, trust but verify. Meaning that you need to have a, a good KPI, whether this when you delegate a task or best ask them to do, you need to make sure that it's going to be delivered as well. If it's not delivered, we need to find an honest conversation how it's going to be delivered in the future as well. And this is basically bring me to the second point, which is communication. 
being remote or basically not be able to see each other every day, communication is always a key. And communication is a key not only for, for work, but also for your life, right? So we need to always, and I, I always believe this, that offer communicate is overrated, meaning that people say you keep offer communicating and those kind of stuff. What I realized that when you think you're offer communicating, it's not always that you already offer communicating. The threshold is quite high. So it's always good to keep repeating yourself until someone in the organization in the lowest level, or basically someone that's quite far from you, able to repeat the sentence or the communication you try to, to came across. So that's basically what I learned. Keep communicating all the time. One-to-one is a, is a good form to basically get to send your message across and basically a phone call, WhatsApp, whatever it is, always try to communicate with your team. And it's always a two-way street and you should be able to be able to open yourself, meaning that if they need any help, you need to be able to respond to that as well. And the other important thing for me to finally is the team building spirit as well. What I said before is more my relationship with one of the team member. But what's the most important thing is that they feel, all of them feel as a team. There are so many occasions in my team that, and this is life, someone can get pregnant and need to do maternity leave, someone can get sick, someone in the family can get sick, and there's always a time that you don't have a full team. And when you don't have a full team, you need to be transparent with your team that you need the other to step up and basically have this person. And what I realized when, they, when the whole team feel that they are a team, they are more willing to help each other. Because they know if they didn't help each other, it's going to impact them anyway. And also it's helping your friend or basically even helping your family. So that's what I like about team. So for me, I think that you need to have a trust. Remember that FaceTime is not equal to output. Keep communicating and also make sure that have this uh, one team, I would say team spirit, or basically make sure that your team is a team. I think the trust is super important. And because of the COVID-19, it introduced a lot of us about remote working and uh, work fully distributed team. Now, remote working is probably something that is quite normal in Australia. And I know it's quite normal in some other part of the Western world. I suspect that the remote working is not so much of the common thing in Indonesia or Malaysia as well. What has been the major learning curve for you guys about the remote working in Indonesia and how do you trust when everyone is remote working? Again, it depends on the person. But what I realize, (laughs) remote working need to have a good infrastructure in the first place anyway. And then what I realized, most people, that they don't really have a reliable and uh, fast internet connection at home. So working remotely is still a luxury, mainly in Indonesia. And this one, actually, this is a two-way street, meaning that because of this situation, the employee sometimes prefer to work from the office. And because of that as well, because they feel actually more contributing and more efficient being at the office. So this is possible from the manager or the business owner, they also still have this mentality that we discussed before, the FaceTime. So I need to see you working in order to make sure that you work. So yeah, I still believe that there's still huge mountain to climb to change this perception, but I think it's there. So we have a couple of different unicorn in here that basically change this, change, I would say the shape of and the, and the culture in the country. All the unicorn companies I know in here they introduce 100% working from home since COVID. And they're committed to actually let everyone do it as well post-pandemic. So maybe with this kind of players in the market, it will give pressure to the other companies to actually follow through. And also at the same time, to make people realize that having their good, reliable internet connection is also essential for their home. When they realize as well, maybe they can work and efficient at home by having this internet connection, maybe they can spend more time with their family or spending less time in the in the traffic. So yeah, it's re- I think it's a, it should be two way street, meaning that the individual needs to realize that this is what he or she wants, and also from the manager, you should be able to facilitate and enable that as well. 
Well, while I am not a unicorn, I am super committed for my product development team to be 100% remote working and fully distributed as well. It would be great to share some of the experience in coming months. Now, thank you so much, Albert, for coming on to the show. I have two final questions for you before concluding the podcast interview. Number one, what is your most important first principle? I think keep curious. <laughs> That's basically my in my mantra. I believe you should never stop learning. You can learn from anyone. You can also learn anywhere. And nowadays, it's um, there are so many platform or basically help that you can learn from anywhere. What is one book that you have read and thought it would have been better for your younger self to have? It was and still is How to Measure Your Life by Clayton Christensen. I guess the yeah. Uh, the Harvard professor. So basically, I really like that because the book explains how you should measure your life, meaning that people keep thinking about, I want to get rich. I want to have a nice family. Uh, everyone has a different goal, but you need to be, you need to understand what exactly you want. And then you, you work towards that. For example, I think one of the ex- good example is if you're saying that I want to be, have a nice and long prosperous life, but you work 20 hours every day, that doesn't, that it doesn't help with your goal. Or basically you keep saying that I want to have a nice family, but you, again, coming back to you only focus on work and work 20 hours for 20, 20 hours a day and never spend time with your kids. It's also not working. So you need to understand what's your priority in life. And then you have to take a step back and look at what exactly you spend on your time to, to understand exactly what actually important in your life. That is a nice one. I should look up to that too. Now, once again, thank you so much, Albert, for sharing some of this. I think we have learned so much about the finance automation and the use of data analytics in the aviation industry. I am really looking forward to the release of this podcast episode. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure, Jason. And thank you very much for having me. 